Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us here at this press conference with the Commission of Inquiry in the Occupied Palestinian Territory in Israel. Joining us are the three members of the Commission of Inquiry, Navi Pillay in the center, Chris Sidoti on my right, and Milun Kotari on the far, my far left. Uh, the Commission, as you might have known, uh, they, they presented their first report to the General Assembly this morning, and uh, they wanted to take this opportunity to meet with you now, members of the press. Uh, the Commission, just to give you a bit of background, the Commission of Inquiry was established by the Human Rights Council in May 2021, and three members were appointed just months after that in July last year. So again, the, the Independent Commission presented the first report to the General Assembly. They did their first report to the Human Rights Council prior in June this year. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Pillay for some opening remarks, and then to you for your questions, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself when you pose your question. I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rolando. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to meet with you uh, because the media is invaluable for our work, and we, in turn, value this engagement with you. So, as was just noted, this morning we presented our first report to the General Assembly, and that alone is unusual. Commissions of inquiry do not get the mandate to deliver in Geneva and here. And the reports we delivered are different. This one flowed from the earlier report. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives us great opportunity to engage with states. Uh, and I also noted that we recognize the significance of pre presenting our report to the same body that uh, nearly 75 years ago recommended the establishment of two states, one Jewish and one Arab, side by side. The exchange we had this morning was quite constructive, which will hopefully yield more awareness and support for our work. Uh, unlike uh, other commissions, we have an open-ended mandate consistent with the situation on the ground, which is uh, which is the conflict, conflict and permanent occupation. So as such, given the expansive nature of our mandate, we were focusing on various as aspects of the human rights situation. Uh, and so this particular report is focused only on the occupation, the perpetual occupation and its legality. Um, we are independent experts mandated to investigate all alleged violations of international humanitarian law and allegations of abuse of international human rights law in the occupied Palestinian territory and in Israel. So that's another new aspect that we look at Israel um, and Palestinians inside Israel as well. We are also mandated to investigate all underlying root causes of the recurrent tensions, instability, and protection of conflict. So no time limit there. Look at the root causes from time immemorial to now. So the report we then delivered underscores the reality of the current situation. And this situation is the result of 55 years of Israel treating its occupation of Palestinian territory as a permanent fixture and its annexation of parts of the West Bank while seeking to hide behind a fiction of temporariness. So as such, we, the Commission, conclude that the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory is unlawful under international law due to its permanence and due to the Israeli government's de facto and de jure annexation policies. At our intervention this morning with member states, we recall that any attempt at unilateral annexation of a state's territory by another state is a violation of international law and is null and void. And this principle is laid out in the UN Charter, has been declared here by numerous member states and also expressed throughout a resolution the week before last relating to Ukraine. And so, therefore, we ask the question, why would this not apply to Palestine? 
it's clear to us that the policies and actions by Israeli governments may amount to international crimes. These include the war crime of transferring directly or indirectly part of one's civilian, one's own civilian population into the occupied territory and the crime against humanity of deportation and forcible transfer. Through our investigations, we also found that some of Israel's policies and actions in the West Bank are only cosmetically intended to address their so-called security concerns, and that security is often used as a pretext by Israel to justify territorial expansion. We have also concluded that Palestinians throughout the West Bank are subjected to a coercive environment. This environment is a result of homes being demolished, property destroyed, the excessive use of force by security forces, mass incarcer incarceration, settler violence, restrictions of movement through checkpoints and roads, and limitations on access to livelihoods, necessities, services, and humanitarian assistance, to which I also want to add the different system of justice they have, Palestinians are subject to military justice. Israel, Israelis have the protection of the civilian courts. We also looked at Israeli government policies, which have had a serious multifaceted impact on various aspects of Palestinian life, including access to basic services such as clean and affordable water. Such deprivation has resulted in psychological trauma, which must be urgently addressed. We focused on children and women, the desperate plight of children who for decades have experienced constant military presence and harassment, displacement and insecurity, many feeling little or no hope for the future. It is our sincere hope that the international community gives this the urgent attention it needs. If Israel's continuing occupation is left unaddressed, by the international community. We fear that the conflict will continue interminably. So I want to echo here what we stated this morning. And I repeat, we call on the United Nations collectively and its member states individually to consider urgent measures to ensure that Israel starts complying with its international legal obligations and acts to end the occupation. And throughout our report, we recommended that the General Assembly request an urgent advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the legal consequences of Israel's permanent occupation of the occupied Palestinian territory, of policies employed to achieve this, and of its refusal to respect the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. In other words, for the ICJ to look at the consequences of this permanent occupation. And so I also take this opportunity to reiterate that it is the obligation of third states and the United Nations to ensure respect for international law and call for member states to employ appropriate measures to fulfill these obligations. Now, there have been lots of complaints from certain states about uh, the open-ended mandate and that there's no cut-off date. They seem to accept an occupation that has no end, but they have complaints about uh, this commission. But the open-ended mandate enables us to address in depth some of these issues. And, and one that, are, uh, that occurs to us is the role and responsibilities of third party states in uh, in uh, supporting or helping with finance and morally and illegal occupation. So we sincerely hope these messages are heard and appropriate action is taken in this regard. So thank you very much for giving me a hearing on, on just a synopsis of what was done. We're happy to take your questions, all three of us. And let me say all three of us in other capacities have been inside Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much, Ms. Pillay. Now over to you for your questions. First question, please, in the front row. 
Sherwin Briceby, South African Broadcasting, and on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Welcome back to the United Nations, uh, former High Commissioner. Um, the Israeli ambassador today in that uh, session in the third committee said that he had exposed a lack of legitimacy of your commission, who despite their hatred for Israel and anti-Semitic remarks were nonetheless appointed by the Human Rights Council. I wonder how you will, how you respond to such criticism. And is your commission going in the future to look at the possibility of Israel committing crimes of apartheid? Thank you. You know, uh, in my response to, uh, during question time, I, I focused on that because it was so offensive. I said, all three of us are not anti-Semitic. Let me make that clear. Um, and, and, and then to add uh, insult to injury, they said, the, they said that the report is also anti-Semitic. Now, there isn't a word in this report that can even be interpreted as anti-Semitic. So, of course, it's not new to us that this is always raised as a diverge, diversion. The president of the, uh, third the uh, General Assembly asked them to address the content of the report. So no one did. Um, it's quite clear. In fact, Sherwood, I said I'm 81 years old, and this is the first time I've been accused of anti-Semitism. And we, we sent messages to the Secretary General and to states that here's three of us who, uh, I mean, without any remuneration, uh, uh, were asked to serve. We didn't, we didn't apply for these positions. And we're giving all our time, energy, because we're so committed to justice, rule of law, issues, and human rights. And we should not be subject to abuse such as this, which is just totally false. You know, I don't want to go into all the things I said. They're all false and lies. Uh, and, but really, the issue of accusations of anti-Semitism has been addressed by the president of the uh, Human Rights Council on our behalf. So did you have a second? Yes, so you know we've all all been urged by very many uh, serious NGOs to to address apartheid in our report. It's a manifestation of the occupation. So we here in this report are focusing on the root cause as we see it, which is the occupation, and and of course part of it is lies in the apartheid and discrimination. We will be coming to that. That's the beauty of this open-ended mandate. It gives us a scope to go in-depth onto many issues, and apartheid would be one of them. Look, I just, uh, uh, if I may very briefly, um, look, I, I've got a long-standing rule that I don't comment on statements made by politicians during election campaigns. So I, I'm not going to comment on what was said, but on what was not said. The, the statement did not deny our finding that the occupation was permanent. It did not deny our use of extensive commentary going back decades indicating the permanence of the occupation. It did not deny any of the evidence that we produced about the circumstances of the occupation and in particular the policy relating to settlements. The, the statement was far more interesting for me in what was not said rather than in what was said. And essentially, if you do read the statement, you'll come to the same conclusion that I did, that there is no denial on the part of the government of Israel about the essential findings of our report. And that's the most significant thing about what was said this morning. I just wanted to add that uh, on the question of apartheid, um, we will get to it because we have, uh, you know, many years and many issues to look at. But we... we um, we think a comprehensive approach is what is necessary. So we have to look at issues of settler colonialism, the whole history. We have to look, you know, we are, we've mandated to look at root causes. We have to look at the issue of self-determination. And, uh, and, and so apartheid by itself is a very useful paradigm, but we, are, we have a slightly different approach, but we will definitely get to the question. Thank you. James, please. James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Two questions for you. I know you take a very long view and look at everything, and you have, as you just said, examine everything, everything um, um, in detail. But if I could get reactions to from you from the commission on recent events, 
Um, the deadliest day this year for Palestinians on Tuesday, six Palestinians killed, and in recent weeks, Israeli lockdowns and road closures across the West Bank. My second question, you talked about third-party states. There's clearly one I want to examine, which is the U.S. Um, the U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield this week has been attending a meeting on the plight of the Uyghurs. She's met the special rapporteur for Iran. She met the, special, she met the COI for Syria. Is she meeting you? And Balloon will, will obviously take those questions. I just want to immediately say, no, we've tried, we've written, we've got no answer from the U.S. ambassador in uh, Geneva or here. You know, I think they're afraid of this mandate. It's, it's, a, it's quite different, this mandate. If I may dare to say, it goes into the political issue rather than just reporting on violations, who killed who and what happened, the episodes. Of course, we're gathering all the information because we have an investigative mandate. We're gathering all the information on current developments, human rights violations, attacks, and, and the activities of the defense force. Uh, Neither Israel nor the uh, U.S. ambassador would agree even to see us for a conversation, let alone letting us into Israel. Yeah, and, um, you know, this question of, uh, um, the, as Navi Pillar is saying, the, there's something about our commission that has received, a, let's say, a different response or a response at a higher level. So we have, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel sending a statement. You saw yesterday uh, in, in President Biden's statement after his meeting with uh, the President of Israel, he referred to our commission. And, and I think what's, um, so, so in a sense, that's good. I mean, the commission gets, uh, the reports get, uh, get attention. But also, um, it's important for us to understand and to try to counter the, in a sense, the politicization of the issue is coming from those countries and those diplomats. It's not coming from us. Um, so, so, you know, this is something that we have, we have to look at. Uh, regarding your question about responding to events, uh, as Navi is saying, it's not, our mandate is different. We want to speak primarily through our reports, but you will see in our reports that we've talked about Masa Faryata, we've talked about, so, so, and ours is an investigative mandate. So we are collecting all the information. We are preserving the information. We will use it in a, in a judicial, you know, with other ju with judicial bodies when, when it is necessary. So the mandate is different in that sense. Um, but with, with the caveat that, as Navi and Malun have said, we, we haven't examined these things closely. Um, I, I still have to say that we are extraordinarily anxious. Um, and it doesn't appear that the seriousness of recent events has impinged itself on the consciousness of the rest of the world. Um, I mean, we've, we've all, we've followed very closely in our work, professionally, the situation in Israel and Palestine for a very long time. And uh, the, the tensions have been rising, the sense of frustration, particularly amongst young people, has been rising. Uh, the, the attacks inside Israel in April have proved to be a catalyst for the most intensive Israeli security forces actions in the West Bank for a very, very long time. And it appears, without us investigating it, so th this is working on our experience rather than our actual investigation, um, it, it would appear that it's on the brink of any authorities, Israeli or Palestinian, having significant control over a growing number of autonomous groups that are on the knife edge of intense frustration. Well, they have experienced intense frustration, so on the knife edge of, of violence. Um, I think that Israelis should be very, very worried. But because this is all occurring in the West Bank, there is not much evidence of Israeli concern at all. But the rest of us should be very worried too, because it could indicate that, um, that, that the West Bank in particular is on the brink of another very, very serious uh, outbreak of, of entrenched violence that could go on for years. So um, anxious would be the word that I would use, extremely anxious as to what this um, 
what, what's, what's going to come from this. Yeah, if I can just add, actually what I found partly disturbing in our dialogue today at the third committee was that uh, most of the states when they were speaking seemed to be unmoved by these horrific events over the last few months. They, they spoke as if it was last year, as if nothing has happened, nothing has changed. And, and that's, that is concerning that member states at the General Assembly either are not following the events or are following them but choosing to ignore them because they have either a certain allegiance with Israel or there is just you know no sort of sense of what to do with all this information and they feel uh, as, as a body they don't, they don't know how to go forward. Thank you all. Yes, a gentleman in the center with a gray jacket. Stefano Vaccara, La Voce di New York. Um, I understand that you um, are investigating, and so it's an investigation. He's not, you're not going to then, I guess, and you're not going to propose solution, or are you? Uh, but my question is about, this is the oldest conflict at the United Nations. I mean, since the, the birth of the United Nations, we've been having the Israeli, uh, uh, Palestinian conflict. So if you just, um, um, let's imagine a, a miracle, and tomorrow you are called by the government of Israel, the leaders of uh, the Palestinians, and even the President of the United States, and they ask to you what we should do, what is the solution to our problem, and this, do you have any idea what it could be? Well, the main answer is the occupation has to stop. So that's what we identify. Uh, if they're negotiating, they can negotiate the rest. For instance, what is the Israeli military doing in Palestinian territories? They must pull out of that. That would be one. They must stop annexing land and using them for military purposes. I can, you know, I can think of a number of first steps that should be done before they enter into talks. I think what you have to look at is um, what are the actions that Israel is taking that are making the situation more incendiary. So in addition to what Navi is saying, uh, stopping the expansion of settlements, uh, controlling the settlers who have effectively become like a paramilitary force now. They, they can do whatever the hell they want. They can, you know, uh, raid homes. They can destroy the olives. They, they can just, uh, and it's not only the settlements, it's also the outposts. So, so essentially, it's become a means of consolidating the occupation uh, and taking over more and more land. And they're completely lawless. And, and as Navi was saying, they, they're not even, they, they have to apply, uh, you know, they abide by civilian law while the Palestinians have to uh, abide by, by military law. So there's a number of immediate steps that could be taken, which could be, somebody asked the question, confidence building measures. Uh, but we don't see that. In fact, in our report, we say clearly that there are no sign of the occupation uh, being, you know, either slowed down or reversed. If anything, Israel has taken the decision that it's, that's how it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be permanent. And we haven't seen any evidence to the contrary. So how can we talk about peace or negotiation, you know, before there are any uh, measures taken from the Israeli side? Thank you both. Uh, yes, uh, okay, question here, then in the back, please, sir. Up to you. A question for Chairwoman Pile. Um, you talked about apartheid being looked at somewhere down the road. You're already on record vocally as declaring Israel as an apartheid state. You're vocally a proponent of uh, boycotting and sanctioning Israel. Three weeks before you were appointed chairwoman of this commission, you were signatory to a letter to President Biden uh, attempting to implement punishment on Israel. So you have essentially prejudged every matter that is before this commission in one form or fashion. This commission is supposed to be impartial. That's the UN fact-finding you know, requirements. How can you sit here and tell the world that this is an impartial commission when you have, in your own personal capacity, prejudged every matter already before this commission? Thank you. Uh, could you just identify your... Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Wagenheim, I-24 News. 
Well, Mike, it's all news to me that I have done all this. I have signed no petition. Or it's, it's on record, no man. Statement. It's on record. Yeah, Everything's I, on record. I'd like to see it. I've never seen it. I, you know, because then maybe somebody has used my name. I want to know. Uh, I recall one statement I made in South Africa because the press were there, and they asked me about BDS, for instance, and I said that that was a strategy that worked in South Africa when people have no other nonviolent means of resisting. It's, it's one of the things they resort to. So all that's been twisted into that I'm a campaigner for BDS. You know, I truly am not. The greater part of my professional life was serving as a judge. And nobody accused me of impartiality because you can see in the judgments and the evidence, every judgment of mine was confirmed on appeal. So really, I would not do that, you know. And how would I exercise the prejudice anyway? I'm dealing with international law here. Where would I come in with the prejudice? I'm dealing with the previous ICJ judgment saying that the occupation is wrong. I'm dealing with Security Council resolution, what uh, adopted like 20 years ago. Security Council resolution saying that the uh, there should be a two-state solution and the occupation must end, you see? So we, if you look at this carefully drafted report of ours, it's fact-based and law-based. Thank you, John. Like, we'd like uh, the media to respond um, and states to respond to the facts in the reports. Um, as now you're saying, that, I mean, the facts are there, the law is there, there's a range of Security Council and GA resolutions that have not been complied by at all with, with Israel. So instead of, and if the, and to to debate with us on on what is in the what is fact, factually and legally based uh, reports, instead of taking us off on what is a diversion on whether it's anti-Semitism or it's what we said before we became commissioners, uh, we would really like to have a, a, a robust discussion on the facts. Follow up, quick follow up. So international law is international law, certainly. There have also been Security Council resolutions condemning Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad for firing rockets into Israel. There have been Security Council discussions about pay for slay, Palestinian Authority policy. These have not been addressed at all. It's all been one-sided in the two reports. Are you going to be looking into those matters? Yes, absolutely. We cannot not address the issue. Uh, we condemn any form of violence, especially against civilians, both Palest on Palestinians and uh, Israelis. And this morning, I reminded the uh, representative of Israel that I was the only High Commissioner for Human Rights who was invited on a mission to Israel. So where we were free to talk to anyone from the president down to others. So I, I do have personal knowledge of how the children are traumatized and injured in the rocket attacks. So that's why I said this open-ended mandate gives us a scope to address uh, themes. And obviously, one will be the acts of uh, armed groups, armed Palestinian groups. Can, can I just make a brief comment that our report in June did refer to the Hamas rocket attacks. Indiscriminate firing of rockets into civilian population areas is a war crime. We said that. and and. There is no doubt about that as a fact. The, the obligations under international humanitarian law and international human rights law bind all those exercising some form of state authority in Israel, the West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. And we will deal with it. Um, what I find irritating, to be, per to be very frank, is that we are restricted to writing 10,700 words in reports for the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, including footnotes, including footnotes. And there seems to be this expect expectation that we will deal with every single issue immediately. And when someone's pet issue is not there, that, that's, that's something to condemn us for. The, the, the real advantage of this commission having an indefinite life is that we can actually plan work and we can deal with this comprehensively. And I think you will find that in our report next June to the Human Rights Council, um, which we are already working on, there will be more comprehensive coverage of a number of thematic issues than what we have been able to do in the reports to date. 
So be patient. You know, since we, we began our work, uh, we have been requesting uh, Israel to let us in. Let us into the, um, inside the Green Line, let us you know, into the occupied territories. Um, and they haven't given us permission. So if Israel has a story to tell, if there are stories of children, if we, we would like to go. We, we will speak to the families, we will report on that. But they have to let us in, and, and they're, they're refusing to do that. Thank you all. Uh, gentlemen in the back, I think you had your hand up, or is it? Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm Luke. Uh, Luke Trice from the Times of Israel. I was going to ask another question. Um, so, like, I understand a future report will be more comprehensive, but a lot of the criticism from Israel is that it's 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 been entirely left out of the most recent report. Um, Hamas rockets and terror are not mentioned at all. Um, so is, th is there a reason it was entirely left out of this report, and will future reports also be very focused on the Palestinian side? The, the reason you don't see it in this report is that this report is looking at the occupation. It's as simple as that, 10,700 words, and we're looking at the lawfulness of occupation. Um, I think you will find that in the, the next report, we will be dealing with the the thematic issues there. We, we, we've decided that we will respond thematically in our reports rather than trying to cover every single contemporary event as it occurs. And the thematic events that we'll be addressing in our next report um, will in fact take us into the actions of all of the duty bearers um, in relation to the theme that we take up. Thank you, Chris. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I have two questions. Um, the first one is a general one, and that's regarding uh, you, each one of you worked on so many different uh, themes, so many different countries. Did you face uh, similar attacks to the ones you are facing when you work on Palestine and your work uh, and human rights there? And my second question is about um, the fact that your uh, report or your mandate also has to do with to tackle the issue of Palestinian citizens of Israel, discrimination they face. And if you could say more to the fact how important is this uh, to the general uh, issue of um, the, the, the situation on the ground uh, and to, to solving the issue. Thank you. You know, I served six years as High Commissioner of Human Rights. Yeah, you're right. The abuse held against us and the name calling is, is different and it's because I feel this mandate, um, I doubt Israel would have invited me if they even thought that I was anti-Semitic. Right? President Mandela wouldn't have sent me to go and do work in the international courts if I had behaved in any way that discriminated on any grounds. So the uh, abuse is so bad and so false, we have no way of defending this because we find now that states are repeating these allegations without checking. Uh, but we can handle this, you know. We, yeah, we old now, so we seasoned, we can handle this and we do it by correcting the picture. However, we did fight back a little and, and uh, said to the chef de cabinet to tell the secretary general to issue a to issue statements, he has to protect people like us who come and serve the United Nations. He has to protect us from personal attacks. But, but still, for me, that's a peripheral a minor issue. You know, two awards were withdrawn. I didn't ask for the awards, awards, but these two awards were withdrawn by two states in Germany because the, the build or something published uh, statements that I was anti-Semitic. So if states are going to take the false allegations seriously, then it needs to be addressed at the highest level in the UN, was that my, was my view. Uh, and sorry, what was the second part? Uh, I, 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 I can take that. Right. Um, yes, actually, uh, one of the unique aspects of our commission is that we have been mandated to look at the situation inside Israel. And uh, we are looking at the situation of the Israeli-Palestinians. Um, and in fact, you'll see in this report that we've drawn a parallel between what 
the way in which uh, the Israeli Palestinians inside the Green Line are treated and the way they are in the occupied territories. And in fact, if you know, if you remember the first decades after Israel became a state, they, they were under military military law. So a lot of the, um, you know, what we would call violations or uh, illegal practices that Israel is following in the West Bank are lessons learned from what is happening inside the Green Line. And we are particularly concerned about the Bedouins um, and, and, and the unrecognized villages in the Galilee. We, we will be look, definitely be looking at that question in one, of, in one of our future reports in more detail. Thank you both. Further questions? Go ahead, James. Next question from online. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yes, I didn't see that. Please uh, unmute whoever is asking the question. And could you identify yourself, please? Yes. Uh, my name is Benny Avni. I'm with uh, New York Sun. Uh, two questions. First of all, about methodology, from what I understand, there were questions uh, that, that you relied a lot on NGOs and so on. Uh, I am told that there were several NGOs that sent you all kinds of comments and, and reports that were ignored. Could you answer that? And secondly, a wider question, which is uh, you keep uh, praising the open-ended nature of this uh, commission. My question is, why is it that this is the only open-ended commission on, on, of inquiry around the world? I mean, shouldn't there be an open-ended commission on the Uyghurs in China, the women in Afghanistan and Iran and so on? Why is this one so um, central and the first one? Is it because Jews control the uh, social media or something like that? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll t maybe if you want to take the first question on NGOs, and then I could maybe perhaps I can chime in on the Human Rights Council decisions about open-ended mandates, but go ahead. So, of course, Rolanda will answer you, but just remember, we didn't create this ma mandate. The st member states did. Um, one of our um, f first uh, methods was to call for submissions. And it's true, we've received thousands of submissions. Uh, but we've always directed that. This is a theme we're now addressing. Uh, please let us have your submissions. And we intend to do that, assuming we are dealing with... Uh, uh, atrocities or activities of other duty bearers, we will direct the public's attention to that. So we are getting uh, very many responses. We didn't, we didn't ignore, some, some of them are a, a bit difficult to read. I think there were five million uh, uh, submissions or emails ca came from one address. And they t it's, it's a lot of work to go and look through all of them, but I think the team is, is examining them. It seems that they really are uh, uh, records of uh, Holocaust victims and so on. So not relevant to us. Our mandate doesn't require us to look at the Holocaust. So we don't ignore them. We, we, uh, we study them, but obviously we can't respond to every submission that we receive. To, to your first question, Benny, the answer is simple. The decision to establish the Commission of Inquiry was taken by states, and that would be the case for establishing any other investigation, any other Commission of Inquiry, open-ended or not. Uh, to the issues that you've actually mentioned yourself, these issues have been raised uh, ad nauseum, I would say, by the Human Rights Council, uh, not necessarily through the action on resolutions, but they have been addressed at the Human Rights Council, which provides a space to hear those views. And of course, the commissioners have already uh, just made, their, made their comments. On one that. second, one Sorry, second, just Benny, to follow please. Up on this. Uh, one one all second. All three of you. Could I finish? All three of the panelists. Can Can you hear me? Uh, I just wanted to finish my thought before I, if you oh, want to ask a follow up. I know this is a bit awkward with this two way communication, yeah. but I just wanted to note that, of course, that the commissioners made their their views are uh, very clear on uh, the interpretation of the mandate. Um, so I won't go into that, but just to emphasize that it's a, it's a state-led decision. Go ahead. Right. But, but my, to follow up on that, all three of the panelists are very um, experienced human rights uh, um, advocates. 
and activists. Uh, can you tell me what is your view on why this is the only issue that needs um, permanent uh, inquiry? I, I want to hear from the panelists. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think it is the only issue that needs permanent inquiry. And the, the comment that I've made in the past is to compare it with my experience just a few years ago, where I was a member of a similar commission of inquiry dealing with Myanmar. And uh, that, that inquiry was first appointed for one year, and then it was extended for a year. And that experience, I don't mind saying, was an absolute nightmare. Um, it took us in the first year three months to get our staff um, we worked with the information we then had available and produced our report. And literally, the day that we thought that we were going out of existence, we found that the council gave us another year. We lost all of our staff because they were only employed for 12 months. We started with zero again. And we had to recruit again, which took another three out of the 12 months of year two. And we had to work out what we were going to write about in year two. What I am enjoying about this commission of inquiry is that we actually have the capacity to plan. Um, we, can, we can look at what subjects we're going to deal with at any particular time and try to bring a little bit of efficiency to our work, um, a bit of depth to our work, not try to do everything at once and, and use the resources that we've got well. So I had no part, obviously, in the council's decision, but I, I can say based on my experience with the Myanmar Commission that this is a far better way of working. The, the only drawback um, is more theoretical than real at the moment. We're appointed on an open-ended basis. Um, that also means we can be terminated at any time. At least if you're appointed for a year, you know you've got a year. Um, even, all of those who are complaining about the open-ended basis, I should add, have none of them have proposed abolishing us, but, but that, that's one of the risks we face. But as somebody given the responsibility of running this institution, this, this, this commission, um, I really like the idea of being able to bring some logic to the work, um, to plan to do it effectively and to do it efficiently. So I, um, I hope that they'll continue us and let us do the job because it gives us great, a, a lot more opportunities than the way the council has acted with some others. I should also just in passing reflect that we're not the only open-ended body that the council establishes. We're the only open-ended commission of inquiry, but the investigative measure me mechanisms established for Syria and for Myanmar are open-ended. Um, each of those have got around about 64 staff, um, which is many times the staff that we or any other commission of inquiry have got, and they're existing on a permanent basis. Um, so th th there are other, and others in addition to that, the, the Advisory Council or the Human Rights Council, for example, is a continuing mechanism. So we're not the only open-ended mechanism, but if you ask me as the person that's appointed to, to be involved running it, give me this process than what I had to put up with with Myanmar any day. Also, I think it's important that when you look at the resolution that uh, established this commission, we are supposed to look at root causes, we're supposed to look at situation inside Israel, we're supposed to look at third party responsibility, it would be impossible to do that in a year or two. So it makes very much sense that we are given an open-ended mandate. And I would add there are several other open-ended mandates of the Human Rights Council and all one needs to do is look at the website and you can see the, la the large array of them. Um, maybe we'll take James again, go ahead. Um, yeah, just quickly following up on that, I mean, I'm just interested in what your resources are, what your staffing is and whether you have the capacity to do any original independent investigation or whether you're looking at other reports. And to the chair, perhaps, you know, as, as High Commissioner, you had all of the UN system, you, you, um, Human Rights Office people. Do, are you happy with what you've got to do this job? Am I allowed to shed a few tears? <laughs> Firstly, I, I, I objected that... Uh, my successor, Michelle Bachelet, only motivated for 24 posts. And we said, how can we do all this work? You know, we also have investigation, criminal prosecution, identify perpetrators, collect and gather and preserve evidence. Uh, 
So the Deputy High Commissioner battled like anything, but one third of that, of that request was sliced off. And we hear now Republican senators boasting that they successfully cut our resources by one third. So 18 staff, then along comes UN mandatory recruitment process. They only have like 10 staff so far, just 10. So we couldn't, can't begin certain work investigations and so on. We intend to do our own independent investigation on, on every issue, including uh, apartheid, including the impact of the, ra ra the rocket attacks on children in Israel. There are really many issues, but we need to make, have our own investigations. We need to have a military advisor. We need a journalist to, to uh, look after communications for us. You see, we borrowed Rolando. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> communication point, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Say that uh, actually, um, the story is not over because we understand there are certain countries, uh, led perhaps by the United States, uh, who are going to continue to try to further reduce our budget, and uh, we expect the UN to push back. But uh, that's going to be a constant struggle for us. But in terms of the recruitment, we were given 18, and I think we'll very soon get there. So we will begin our investigative work. Uh, time for maybe one last question, if there are any. Otherwise, okay, Mike, go ahead. Thanks so much. So this commission goes back 47, 48, essentially. So I'll, I'll try to make the point succinctly. Israel returned Sinai to Egypt in return for peace. Israel, Israel withdrew from Gaza, dismantled settlements in Samaria. Today, Israel signed a deal with an enemy state over disputed territory. From your words here today and based on the text of the report, it seems that you, you judge this, this occupation, as you call it, as something without context, as if the Israelis are just there for the fun of it to, to suppress or oppress Palestinians. I, is there something coming in future reports about actual context to this conflict rather than everything has to start with Israel, Israel withdrawing and then we can just go from there? It, it seems strange given Israel's willingness to withdrawal repeatedly from its um, boundaries in exchange for peace. I think your question alerts us to how vast this is when you look, when you're asked to look at the root causes. Um, we, we get interventions like you've just said, you know, so, so we're getting it from civil society, independent experts, and it's a, it's a matter of concern to us that, yes, we explain the entire context from the time it's stated. We said in our report this morning that we don't see any sig significant activities to end the occupation. But we are not ignoring significant steps that have been taken in the past, such as uh, moving out of Gaza and so on. So we will be addressing those quite comprehensively. I think uh, your question can be, I mean, has Israel really withdrawn from Gaza? There's a complete air, sea, and uh, land blockade. Uh, they can go, the, uh, all these, uh, in, you know, incursions into Jenin, that's Area A. They're not supposed to be there in Area A, in the West Bank. So, so and, and what about the Golan Heights? So the question very much is, you know, there has to be, it's not a question of just empty land, it's a question of where people live, and is Israel doing anything to dismantle that? And we don't see any evidence of that. Do you, do you, I'm sorry, but do you ask why? Do you ask why it's been done multiple times that Israel's withdrawn, but not this time? The, the question of why doesn't seem to be there. If they are, we are allowed into Israel, we'll ask the relevant officials and the military these questions. Uh, We're asking for meetings with representatives. And they are in a position to tell us what they've done, you know. We, we really want to be, uh, do accurate reporting here on all the activities. So that would be one of the reasons why we asked for a meeting with the ambassador of Israel in Geneva. And here. And here. That's the reason. 
give us give us your side of the story because we want to represent facts fairly. Thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. Um, and please uh, take, make sure you take a look at the report and the statement which is online that was delivered this morning to the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you.